conference lecture. Welcome to this afternoon's lecture, Trumpeter Swans Back in Ontario's Ecosystem. I bet on a spring like day like this, you can imagine yourself having a picnic by a pond, observing swans with their young feeding nearby, dipping their long graceful necks into the water <clears throat> to scoop up food. Hopefully you're not feeding the swans your egg salad sandwich. They might be one of two native species, the tundra swan or the trumpeter swan. The mute swan, a naturalized species from Eurasia could also be swimming nearby. This afternoon, we're gonna learn more about the trumpeter swan. It's quite a remarkable bird, one of the largest in the world, which had a near death experience with extinction. The devotion and hard work of volunteer scientists and caretakers, among them, our guest speaker, Donna Lewis, brought the species back to life in Canada. But first, before we get started, the Toronto Field Naturalists would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. These lands and rivers are now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and are covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. TFN, respecting the spirit and practice of reconciliation, continue to look for opportunities to connect people with nature on these lands. Donna is a professional gardener, but she has loved and cared for animals all her life. She grew up on a farm where animals were around her all through her childhood. Today, as caretaker for the Stronach family estate in Aurora, she manages a flock of 250 trumpeter swans that winter in open water on the estate. Donna's relationship with trumpeter swans began after she met Harry Lumsden in 2010, a retired biologist and research scientist with Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources. He was an international authority on waterfowl. After he retired, he became the leader of the Ontario Trumpeter Swan Restoration Program. In her talk, Donna will tell you more about what she learned from Harry, who by the way, died at age 99 just last month and how her observation of the swans on the Stranach estate amplified her appreciation and her public advocacy for this species. <clears throat> the trumpeter swan is the heaviest living bird native to North America. It has a wingspan of nearly eight feet, the big ones do. Its recovery in Ontario and across Canada is quite a remarkable story. Their population was decimated in the last century and a half for their meat, their feathers, and even the skin of their feet. None existed in Ontario in 1982 when Lumsden started his captive breeding program with eggs from a newly discovered population in Alaska. Today, <clears throat> there are over 2,500 trumpeter swans in Ontario and 46,000 across North America. Really remarkable. Donna will tell us how this came to be. It's a story of hope and what a determined band of volunteer citizen scientists can achieve. Please welcome Donna. And I'll just get my screen shared. Share. And where are we? Play. I believe that looks okay now. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, back in the ecosystem, the return of trumpeter swans. So all you birders will disagree with me, but they think they're songbirds. So we can't do this without recognizing Harry Lumsden. He only recently passed away. He was one month short of his 99th birthday. He's been awarded a variety of awards, including an honorary, uh, a distinguished ornithologist award uh, with the OFO. And that particular arg article has almost 10 pages of his accomplishments. He did keep trying to uh, educate people and he had his own pair of swans on his property 
And during doors open in Aurora, he had the uh, his property open so people can continue to see it. Even into his uh, late 90s, he was still researching and trying to understand all the different behaviors that trumpeter swans have. He helped and ex mentored many of our banders, explaining them to the different things that we did. And he banded up until he was past 90, though we didn't encourage it because it was, they're big birds. We went to, I actually went to a, a conference with him as well as some of the other people. This is Akina, who is also a re rehabilitator. Uh, this was in Maryland. Uh, forget it. Maryland was the International Swan Conference as well as the North America Trumpeter Swan Conference. He spoke at the Y Marsh on numerous occasions and had a great relationship with them as they were one of the cooperators. And what I do for a living is I garden. And I, this is a little bit of how intense of a garden I actually take care of. It's uh, pretty phenomenal. Uh, it sort of uh, helped me become a better member of the garden club I also belong to. But we're here to talk about trumpeter swans. So in 2005, swans were purchased on the property to uh, chase away the Canada geese. You asked a stupid question and you get a stupid answer. I asked, well, who's going to take care of them in the winter? It ended up becoming my job. During that time, I also ended up... Uh, helping some people get some photographs for the magazine with like some co-living with say this is actually one of the nicest articles of an interview with harry lumston i got lucky and my picture was picked for the uh, february of uh, canadian wildlife federation calendar we recently had a large article on the trumpeter swans in ontario nature so during the worst of winter this is a little bit what the, uh, the uh, swans look like on the water here. There is open water, it's in the lower corner there. So I have a trusty wheelbarrow. There's no expensive equipment that belongs with this and buckets. I put the corn in the buckets, the buckets dangle over the edge of this and the swans eat out of them. I don't normally hand feed the swans. So, you can have a better idea of where we're located with the picture of that is Magna head office in the background. It's not a chalet in Europe. And I have a variety of ducks and geese that also take advantage of the open water. This gives you a little idea of them talking. This was only done about three weeks ago. <laughs> So as you can see, those guys were just saying hello. That's not loud by any means. They were happy that I was bringing food down and they were all quite content until it seemed like I was taking too long to put the feed in the buckets. This just shows a little bit of the aerodynamics of a swan as he comes in to land on the snow, which it, of course it was a 10 point landing. Those are giant feet. They're larger than your hands spread out. So the history of the trumpeter swan in Ontario and North America. So between 1700 and 1900, there's the hunting for the fur trade in the Hudson's Bay Company. So some of Harry Lumsden's research also turned up how many swan skins they sold to London, England. And you can see how quickly it started to drop. The last recorded swan shot in Ontario was a migratory bird. It wasn't even a real uh, it, it wasn't 
living in Ontario at that time. So it's been almost 200 years before 1982 when Harry started that we had free flying swans in Ontario. So at one point they thought there were 69 swans and then they found some more swans in British Columbia. And then in 19, uh, what year was that? Uh, they found a population in 1954 of the breeding of uh, trumpeter swans amongst tundra swans. And tundra swans are a native swan of, of North America, which breeds in the extreme far north. So in 82, uh, Harry Lumsden started the program. In 1993, so basically 10 years after he started the program, first pair of wild swans migrated to LaSalle Park in Burlington. So he began the captive breeding program, which released 584 captive reared swans in 54 locations all around Ontario. One of the biggest concerns was about their instinct to migrate being lost, since it had already been documented in uh, Canada geese not migrating as well. The first pair of introduced swans to mate in the wild and migrate out of a release site was from Y Marsh, and that occurred in 1993. That continues today, and they keep going back and forth to the same place they migrated to, which is LaSalle Park in Burlington. 2007, the Ontario population of 700 birds was declared self sustaining but fragile. In 2020, the population is estimated between 28 and 4,000 birds. The little asterisk beside that is partly because some of the birds are, are coming up from the states. We have the, the far western populations, maybe some of the birds from Iowa as well as the other states down there. Some of the reasons you hear about it, but you never see. And I've been searching and looking through the internet, trying different word combinations to find swan feathers being used in hats. I found egret feathers, but I did find some swan down powder puffs. Also found a swan trimmed, swan feather trimmed dress. This uh, picture they put with it in their talk, they say it was the tundra swan that they were, they had decimated. And I'll show you in a few moments uh, why that isn't so. It was it was the trumpeter swan, and I actually have to contact the site and try to get this corrected. So part of the reason was market hunting. They wanted to hunt these birds. They're big. They're easy to and with a gun. It's a lot easier to kill them. So you, they would hunt this, and they set would send this on uh, railway cars to feed the big cities. And Audubon loved the trumpeter swan quill for doing his artwork. So in this diagram, there's a present, these blobs in the middle are the present dis uh, distributions of the trumpeter swans. And you can see there's a red outline on the outside as well as a dark red line on the bottom. This is where we should have swans all through North America. So this is what we have now. In 1968, they expected about 3,700 swans total. In 2015, we have 63,000. So it is working. And we should all be quite proud that finally humans did something good for a change. So this slide I put in partly because I was asked specifically if the tundras and the trumpeters will interfere with their breeding ranges. In Ontario, right now I have a tundra on my pond and I know down at uh, Lake on, on Lake Ontario in a couple locations, there's a few tundras that sort of hang about a little bit, but their breeding areas, the far north. And uh, so their, their pelts, they couldn't be market hunted. There's no way we could have shipped the meat all the way from the far north down to the big cities. It almost all came from the Midwest. So these are where tag trumpeters were originally released to the wild. The red marks on this is where there was year round feeding. So there was open water there. 
and feed was provided. Most of those areas were cooperators. The blue is where they were released and left to their own devices. So as time goes on, please remember the, these sightings are people uh, emailing or calling Harry Lumsden at the, in the beginning and eventually going to our uh, emailing our uh, address, email address, or reporting to Y Marsh. So, so from 12 sightings in 1982, 1,200 sight, uh, 12,000 sightings in 2000, 26,000 in 2020, and you can tell the pandemic has been getting our sightings up as well. In 2021, there's 35,600 sightings. This picture represents the sightings of tag trumpeters only. They're definitely moving all the way to the East Coast. So since the beginning, there's data collected of 267,000 sightings since 1982. And we have had reports of them up in James Bay. We've had reports of one, including a photograph with the tag in Nova Scotia. What this, the swans that aren't made it normally do is, so uh, let's see how the best way to describe us is that they, there's no failure to launch. The parents aren't keeping that at home. They're not going to in, inherit the nesting site or anything else, taking them out, making them move around. So we'll, they don't normally make a, a, a pair until they're almost four years old. So in the meantime, they can wander around and look for good potential homes. We have uh, records of P61's travels here, and you can see how it's moving back and forth. 956 kilometers to one site. Z41's travels. And it's quite amazing when you look at all the different sightings of where they've been and people are seeing these tags, which makes it extremely advantageous to us to know whereabouts they're all going. And we said 41s, P42s. And these are all from 2016 to 2022, back and forth to the States. Didn't have to cross the border. Patrol <laughs> didn't have to reply to anyone and ask questions. So when you're down by the lake or other areas where you might see swans, there's three types that you'll see in Southern Ontario. You'll see the mute swan which is from Eurasia, it was brought here to bring a little bit of home over here. And it was a little bit like a, a park animal and that people like to see them floating on the waters in these different parks. I used to call it, and I still sort of refer to it as the wedding cake swan. It's a swan that a lot of the swan wedding decorations are modeled after. The trumpeter you see in this picture has his feathers ruffle because the wind was blowing the wrong way. And now at the very front, you'll see a tundra. So they're also known as, they used to be known as whistling swans as well. Uh, all the swans apparently seem to whistle because the whistling refers to the way the wind moves through their wings. So the trumpeter swan is the largest flighted water bird in the world. It is the third heaviest flighted bird in the world. And it is the largest swan in the world. So it has a Roman nose. The tundra swan has a much rounder head. And the beak, I, they, they describe it as a roundish head shape with a dish-shaped profile. It's a little bit more duck-like, except it is still quite a bit larger than a duck. It's the way the eye and the beak meet that can give you a good idea. So the trumpeter can has a wingspan of over six feet. It can weigh up to 30 pounds and a neck length of 60 inches. So they can reach quite deep down into the water to feed. The tundra is quite a bit lighter. And so the, the neck length isn't that much shorter, but it is shorter. The mute swan falls just in between the two. And what people say when they've accidentally shot swans is they thought it was a snow goose. 
which is four to six pounds compared to the the uh, 21 to 30 pounds. And you sort of wonder uh, how much beer they were drinking when they were shooting, which they shouldn't have been. So this is a very interactive sign that's up at Y Marsh where you can also see swans. And this is a swan demonstrating how he didn't actually model for the sign, but he wanted to. So every now and then I get surprises here. And one year I had a, a pair come in. I knew it was new because they only come in late January. And then I saw this poor little signet and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And then I realized it was a tundra signet because he wasn't hardly any bigger than a Canada, full grown Canada goose. This is an example of how hard it is to tell a tundra from a trumpeter. And you, everyone's allowed to get it wrong, but this little guy, and you barely can tell perspective throws it off. That is a tundra swan. And if you look at the way the bill attaches to its head between his eyes, you can see it's much more rounded and not pointed. So they like to nest in wetlands. So they are a marsh bird. Water depth one to five feet. I don't think they would prefer the one feet. I know they'd like it a little bit deeper. They like a mix of vegetation all throughout. And actually, unfortunately, if you like your water lilies, they do too. Building and repairing nests begin, starts in mid-April. The nest diameter is about six feet. In the picture that just popped up, you see it looks like a, a brown little spot in the middle of it. That is the nest. They're often built on top of the previous year's nest or a beaver or muskrat lodge. They're extremely loyal to their nesting sites. Incubation takes a month and they're fully fledged, meaning they can fly in 15 weeks. So this just shows a comparison between the babies, or the cygnets, or the trumpeter versus the mute. And it's sort of funny the way they uh, get older. I have some very adorable baby pictures here. One of my friends is very good at getting these pictures. And this one picture of the adult with the little one is now on the cover of Lake Simcoe Living. I know you guys all needed a little bit of bunch of cuteness just to justify not being outside in this lovely weather. Yeah, it's just, it is really too cute. This is the only thing I get to miss taking pictures of. I see them all winter. I see the adolescent swans, the ones that were hatched in this previous year. And this is a, a rare photo of what something doesn't normally happen with the trumpeters where the cygnets get on the back of the adult. You'll see there's four by the one swan and the other swan with his showing his profile has a baby on his back. So my good friend, Gary, sent me a bunch of from hatching to flying pictures, just to give you an idea of how quickly they grow up. This is June 4th. And a nice, lovely wetland. One, two, three, four, five, six. They're starting off with six. Unfortunately, things do happen and they lose quite a few signets before they reach maturity. D just remember when you see a picture of the young like this, think of Han Christian Andersen, the ugly duckling. So by August 6th, there's three. Six and then June 4th and three by August 6th. August 18th, the primary feathers are coming in now. getting nice and big, constantly feeding. So the young will eat also some insects and uh, snails and a few worms and a few other things that are at the bottom of the pond. They, they do that because they need the extra protein to build bones and muscle. So I also have some uh, pictures of a few behavior. When they are starting to mate, 
or to become a couple, husband and wife, uh, that's about the only time you'll see them touching each other. They won't do it with strangers. They'll only do it with their mate. So they do all these lovely heart poses. Family groups will stay together and they'll also uh, be aggressive to each other to see who is dominant in the winter staging areas. There'll be fights and aggression to each other, trying to establish dominance. And it seems like when they are young and there's a four or five siblings go out together, they almost like act like a little gang and they're always trying to prove that they're tougher than the other. You swear they can hear them going, yeah, you can do it, you can do it. You can get him, he, you're bigger than he is. We'll cheer you on. All that pinching and hitting each other with their wings, they'll never try to do true damage to them. The only time they will do that is when it's a true territory dispute and there's a nest and eggs involved. But at the winter staging area, it's all about meeting and greeting, seeing who's good looking, trying to find someone to love. So this was family day in 2019 with Harry Lumsden and a huge crew of us that happened to be probably some of the stalwarts of the restoration group. Hamilton Harderberg became very important because it's where the first swans migrated to. So it's now the wintering ground for 200 plus birds. That number's basically stayed stable, and not really gone too high or too low. And so it sort of confirms my suspicion that I will never go over 250 birds because it depends on the amount of open water available. But that place is open to the public and you can go and see the swans. Because Hamilton Harbor was also dead for the longest time because it was a commercial port and exported lots of things, there's a minimum exposure to lead because they couldn't fish there. And with it being a commercial port, you're not really supposed to be shooting over it too when there's boats in the harbor. It's a protected area with natural food sources now, especially because the Royal Botanical Gardens down in that area. 80% of the banding in Ontario gets done there. It's got a very safe beach for the people to work on. The swans are fairly accustomed to human beings being there. And we use it for baiting as well. Public education is, we, we used to have family day there. Eventually, I'm hoping we will again. But we also have another site in Washago where we can also go to educate the public as well. And we've had a good turnout there the year we did that. We are the Coots Paradise, which is right beside the, or was part of the Royal Botanical Gardens, has potential nesting habitat and it is actually successful nesting habitat. So at LaSalle Park, when we have a, a family day event, you can see a huge amount of swans there. Also photographers. And they'll get spooked with people going out to ice fish. It's sort of an oxymoron to see a trumpeter swan coming into land with industrial bridges and buildings in the background. So when we tag the swans, they get a metal band around their leg, as well as a tag. And the metal band normally does not come off. So it's a stainless steel lock-on band. And that number there, right beside the 1959, is what we need, and it correlates to the tag data that we have. So this is a wing tag that goes on them. I'm trying very carefully to show you the size of it. It is yellow with a black code. They last about three years. Sometimes they last longer. There have been lots of experiments trying to see if we can make them last a bit longer without damaging the swans as well. It's basically a giant earring. The leg band is placed on the right leg for males, the left leg for females, and normally the leg band will last for life. So this is a little series of pictures done by my friend Laurel. Oh, go back, didn't do that right. 
And this should load the capture. Yes. Are you going to start to play? Yes. The reason we have an airway check is because we do lure them with corn and we hand catch them. We have to make sure their airway isn't obstructed when we do position them for banding. Those bags you saw put in is sort of a recent acquisition. We're testing for lead levels in the swans with the blood collection. And uh, Kina, the one you see tagging here, is a licensed veterinary technician as well. And body conditioning score. Any of you have ever done any bird banding? Yes, the uh, gentilia of a swan is not the same as regular uh, of animals. 9C is the size of the band. Uh, the second bird, there's normally a bit of brown or gray still left in the wings. And uh, it was part of a study at one point to see what kind of levels of parasites that they were having. So they do also been much more adamant about collecting data so that we have more data sets for researchers to use. So these are leg bands where the numbers visible. Any of you that have a nice large camera can normally get these, but you usually end up missing these numbers and it takes a lot of photos to get this. And I've also gone after these leg bands and then had the swan turn around about five minutes later to realize he had a lovely big yellow tag on his other side. So the present dangers in the, to the future of the swans, our biggest problem lately has been lead poisoning. It's from ingesting lead shot and lead fishing sinkers. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit more depth later on. There's also collisions with unmarked power lines. The closest distance between the best distance between A and B is a straight line. And normally power lines are just strung straight over the middle of a marsh with no thought to the fact that it might interfere with large birds landing. The other problem is uh, in Southern Ontario, everyone wants to live here and the wetlands are really a low list, low on the list of priorities. Unfortunately, you can't forget that the wetlands are the kidneys of our planet and we need them as well. So the loss and degradation of wetland habitat is extremely uh, vulnerable to them. Wintering grounds, they need stage areas where they can meet and greet and mix up their gene pool. That will always be under harassment by people, partly because they just want to see them and some of them don't act appropriately, which leads into the next one with human interference, such as harassment by boaters. They don't mean to, they may not even see them. Snowmobiles, that's people going ice fishing. Personal watercraft, that would be stand up paddle boards or whatever, trying to get a look at the nest site, which is would make some swans abandon the nest. People who let their dogs off leash and let them run through ducks because they think it's funny. And there's always the illegal killing of swans. They're not listed for hunting. And some of them are poached, whether they would be listed or not. They're, and they, the lowest on the list is actually what happens naturally, the natural predation of wild animals, birds, and disease. So one of our biggest problems down on Lake Ontario, where you guys are by the harbor front there, is in just ingestion and entanglement and discarded fishing line and hooks. You can see a hook embedded into the swan's tongue. The hook is in the swan's mouth here and the weight is starting to be built up on the line itself with the ice there. This is one that has a whole bunch of fish in line attached. They're feeding in the long grasses where people lose their lines. This one has a very large fishing hook with a spoon on it. This one, the hook was in the back of his neck. Uh, this happened at my place. 
it got so heavy, the ice was over a pound. He could barely lift his head out of the water so he couldn't fly anymore. And he wasn't able to keep his feathers conditioned. As you can see that there's ice on the back of his, on his back with feathers and they never let that happen. It's once they start losing conditioning of their feathers, they can get hypothermia. So this fellow with this big fish hook, that's how big it was. That's a, on a computer screen, that's almost, that's maybe still a little bit small. From ingesting lead shot, uh, a lot of people do know that lead shot isn't allowed to be used for waterfall hunting anymore. It's still used in upland game, but uh, it doesn't dissolve. It doesn't go away. It's in our waterways and our lakes. It can contaminate our waters. And then because the swans are increasing and going into these wetlands and exploring and feeding there, they're ingesting the, this historic, is what I call it, lead shot. So this is the diagnose, diagnostic report. The remains of eroded spit shot fish, fishing weight. So the, the fishing weights are easy, immalleable. They're quick. There is non-toxic fishing weights you can get. These power lines. So this is Desjardins uh, Channel East. There's 45 hydro wires. It's open water. It's a perfect place for the swans to see, and they're not noticing always wires. So this is what happens to a wing that's been badly mangled by hitting it. This is also a survivor of a suspected collision. We called him Cricket. He lived for at least three years that we know of. We would not catch him because we were worried if we hand caught him, we'd damage his neck even more than it already was. But even in flight, you see, he can't straighten out his neck. He needed a good chiropractor. You can see quite how severe that crick is. There's something else that's happened down at the Toronto waterfront called angel wings. When the wings don't properly develop, and it happens in a lot of Canada geese and a lot of ducks, and we're starting to see and that is feeding junk food and uh, feed them brown Whoops. Screen, share, play. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's an avian blue going around, and it's because of people feeding on top of where there's feces and everything else. And we need people to think a little bit about uh, maybe not doing it in the nature, let me throw foods. So I've mentioned before the loss and degradation of wetland habitat. Uh, yeah, this is what happens. If you're not in the floodplain, you can build a house on it. According to Doug Floyd, you can build a house on a floodplain too if he wants some extra taxes, but that's, I guess. So what you can do to help. Avoid the use of lead sinking, lead fishing sinkers and lead shot. Even in upland game hunting, in California, they've banned lead shot there because the condors used to find the kills of the hunters up there. And what few condors they have were starting to die of lead poisoning. So if you have a hunter or fisherman in your life, it'd be a good idea to buy them some toxic free uh, bullets or, or shotgun shells or whatever, or, or lead free fishing sinkers. If you see discarded fishing line from water and shoreline, and I'm pretty sure there's a 
shoreline cleanup probably coming this summer or spring shoreline near you. Or if you're a fisherman, just do your best to try to get it. A lot of places do have places where you can discard that line so you're not taking it back to your car. If you do see sick or injured swans, you can look, report it to the local OSPCA or your local animal control. You can contact us, but please remember we are all volunteers. We cannot do uh, water rescues. If you see someone harassing swans, and unfortunately we had a few where a woman put a swan in her car, someone was taking a selfie with one. Uh, we've had some pretty unique uh, duh type of things happen to poor swans. You can be, they can be reported to the Ministry of Natural Resources or Environment Canada Wildlife Enforcement. The other things you can do is protect your waterways and marshes. Remember, you don't want to manicure a lawn all the way down to the water. You need a five foot buffer of tall grasses if you don't like oh. goose poop. I put this in here and a lot of people don't always understand. Reduce, reuse, recycle. The more, the less garbage we have that goes out into the environment, the cleaner the environment be for the swans. That we have. you have to go out. We need a when planting. So the swans are only a small portion of the, all the species that use wetlands. By us encouraging native species, we're also creating the habitat for the insects that the chickadees and the cardinals and the other birds all love to feed their babies. And if you can, spread the word. You can report the sightings of swans to the Ontario Trumper Swan Restoration. We have a dedicated uh, email. You can also ask questions. And most of the time, if you want, we can send you back information on this. Why Marsh Wildlife Center also has a wonderful website and a swan reporting, uh, a swan reporting, what do you call it? Uh, form that you can fill out as well. These are some of the things that they want you to try to bear in mind when you're looking at a tagged animal and you want to be able to send in the tag or the neck collar if you happen to see a swan from the States. The leg band, if you, if you see a leg band and you can't get the number, if you can even mention that it is a leg banded swan, we may know who's in that area and who it might possibly be. The location. The better the location, the better we know where it is. And if it's in trouble in the future, we might know that, oh, swans were seen there. We can go and see them from there. Also, it shows us where there's good habitat for swans. If you can get the total number of bird scenes marked and unmarked. And some of you may know that we're in starting the second year of a breeding bird atlas. So any behavior like nest building, mating, sitting on a nest, um, not everyone will understand all the different behaviors for the courtship, but at least this behavior, the nest building, if you see them on a hump and they're dragging up pieces of uh, material, you'll understand that. So we can also help rescues that save and re rehabilitate trumpeter swans. Our own Kina is a licensed rehabilitator. Toronto Wildlife Center can do cold water rescues. And they are also a very dedicated group of individuals. Shades of Hope takes a lot up there as well. That's in Peffala and Sandy Pines in Napanee. So this is what uh, Ontario Trumpeter Swan Restoration License Rehabilitation Avery looks like. And uh, the picture, uh, there's a decoy sitting with the signets. We had orphans last year that uh, Kina raised to adulthood and then released. This is in 2016. I had someone come and help rescue a trumpeter swan that was too far out. I couldn't get to him. Uh, lead poisoned and unfortunately he did die. Uh, this was this year. I had two swans that were rescued. One we res we caught on land, one we caught on the water. Uh, unfortunately, also they both died. 
I'm for sure one was lead poisoning. So if you'd like to learn more about trumpeter swans, there's the North American Trumpeter Swan Society. Uh, they have a lot of information on their webpage. Uh, any monies donated to them will be used in their recovery and reintroduction programs in the States. Bird Studies Canada has information on trumpeter swans. Canadian Wildlife Federation also does. Uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation, I believe, is also the one who developed the hinterlands who's who of a video series that we used to see on TV quite often. And you can see most of them on YouTube now. eBird, you can go in there and find data as well as a lot of different information, including sightings list and where they are at any particular time of birds. iNaturalist will cover all the flora and fauna if you're out in a wetland, as well as the birds as well. But if you're a dedicated birder, you probably prefer a dedicated bird list. Cornell Lab, all about birds, also has a lot of information on swans. Your local library is usually underutilized, and I recommend for anyone who isn't a birder who wants to get a field guide to try out the different field guides they have at the library before they invest in one. A lot of people forget you can do that, and luckily, we do have the libraries to rely on. Another great source of information, especially if you have younger people, is Adopt a Pond with Toronto Zoo. They have some amazing handouts that you can get as well as frog calls so yeah the wetlands are diverse you also have a, quite a variety of birds and amphibians reptiles everything that's in that and i still like watching those old hinterlands who's who about the swans okay why is this not moving now great ah there we go. so at this moment, this is our logo for Ontario Trumpeter Swan Restoration. If you want to make donations to help with the, the ongoing care of swans that happen to be in care or are helping with our tagging program or trying to get more uh, universities interested in research or different groups, you do get a tax receipt for donations of $20 or more from the Irish Wildlife Foundation. Information is all there. A lot of people help make this possible. Uh, I'm borrowing, beg borrowing and stealing pictures from all these different people. There may be others I've forgotten. I also want to thank all the people and agencies that share photos and information on the internet, as well as the Trumpeter Swan Society and the members of the Rose Station group in our Facebook group. There's no an awful lot. Nothing's going to get better. It's not. So not doing too bad. Thank you. I can take questions now. And Donna, thank you very much. That was that was really an inspiring presentation. Um, there are two ways you can ask a question. Uh, you can send me directly a chat or send the chat to everyone using the chat feature, or use the um, uh, reaction feature to raise your hand, and Sophia will recognize you and you can ask the question directly. There is a question from Jennifer Smith that came a little bit earlier. Can you elaborate a little bit on the tagging process? How long does it take? How many minutes? <clears throat> uh, how elaborate is it? And is it something a volunteer can learn fairly easily? So the, to do the actual tagging, you have a licensed tagger and you get that through the ministry. Before you're a licensed tagger, you can be mentored and you can go and with the tagging. Uh, I don't do it because I can't kneel as long as I used to. I had some pretty major injuries. It takes about it takes more than 10 minutes for a complete tagging. We're fairly, when we know what we're doing, you're fairly fast and there's data entry. You have to record the tag, make sure it matches the bands you're attaching to the swan because you're not going to re-catch the swan. 
it's uh, it is not very stressful for the swans in the long run because of the way we do it. And that's partly in thanks to Harry Lumps because we didn't have the resources to run swans down in wild wetlands, grab them and tag them. But uh, it can be learned. It's in some respects, it's a lot easier than trying to learn to ban the little guys because I don't have the eyesight to see these little things that I'm sure I could crush in my hand. It, it is very interesting. I've helped hold them. I've helped catch them. I'm not scared of big animals. I've worked with cattle and I've worked with horses. I've, I've actually worked with pigeons as well for squaw things. But uh, the swans are a bird. It's amazing how hot their feet are. But if it's more than, it's almost never more than 10 minutes. It mm. takes you longer to catch the bird than it does to tag it. Right. Um, here's a question from Geraldine Lindley. Is it expected that populations will reestablish in Quebec in the Maritimes? Maritimes, or would, would there need to be provincial programs to help those along? So as far as, far as I know, the, the population in Quebec there's along our border, they're starting to show up there. Whether or not they want to reintroduce the swans, be up to the provincial bodies there. Um, I mean, they could do a restoration group like what we did here, but I am not sure if they're interested or not. Though we, there are people reporting the swans. Mm -hmm. We do the have, American sorry. We do have reports uh, coming that have been coming in for many years from New England, but they're very few and far between. Uh, and there is no programs that we're aware of or any of the northeastern states or the eastern provinces have reintroduction programs. Uh, part of the detriment to trying to do programs in that area is because in the Carolinas, they still have a tundra swan hunt. And if you saw from the pictures how hard it is to tell a tundra from a trumpeter to put in a breeding program and have them decimated with the first hunt would be quite heartbreaking. I think it's, is it Wyoming with red rocks, Gary? Yes. So they have, they monitor the tundra swan hunt. And when they have a bycatch of 10 trumpeter swans, they stop the hunt. Mm. So it's still easy to kill a few too many of our breeding age population. Mm -hmm. So Quebec would be much more likely to have a population eventually reestablish itself, but moving too far east, they are all in trouble of being accidentally shot as a tundra swan. Mm -hmm. well, part, our, our recent data in the last couple of years, um, partially because more people are reporting them, uh, is in eastern Ontario. Uh, the other issue is, of course, there's more, it's more wide open, um, more wild, so we, people don't get to the wetlands, the rivers, and the ponds like as easily as they do here in central Ontario. But there is a very strong population in eastern Ontario that moves between upstate New York, gets into Quebec, uh, and northern uh, New York. It's really good that you're here, Gary. <laughs> uh, another question from Kelly Duffin, uh, Donna. She's very curious about the original historical range of the trumpeter swan. How, how far south did they actually nest in winter? And uh, how far do they live? And she's also heard that they tend to favor less urban environments and smaller lakes. So she's not sure if they were in Lake Ontario before they were extirpated. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they historically, they were very, if you think about the Midwest, it, uh, when you're out in Saskatchewan, they call them sloughs. It's potholes of water everywhere. Uh, they've, in Iowa, they've drained 90% of their wetlands 
So it makes a huge difference for the amount of birds and other things are there. As far as I know, they went as far south as Texas. But uh, for the Lake Ontario, what it is, is Lake Ontario has wave action. It is a winter roost site for all things, all things considered. Uh, they do prefer smaller ponds and wetlands, but they will, if, they, if there's enough vegetation there, they will be more than happy to live there. So there's several ponds in Toronto where trumpeter swans have nested and it wasn't created by humans to do it. Humans can help them in that if it's, they're constantly being predated by uh, raccoons or coyotes, you can put a nest platform out a little bit farther, but they want to be surrounded by vegetation. So when I talked about the fact that the nest on beavers lodges, that's what they used to do. And if you think about it, the beavers were engineers of their habitat, creating a, a very specific water level that wouldn't freeze all the way to the bottom, which was perfect for swans, not huge areas. It wasn't acres and acres and acres and acres or, but they like the, they like, uh, they probably favor between one and six feet in depth for foraging for the most part. So that's not a big deep pond, mm -hmm. but Lake Ontario is a winter staging area because the shores are normally quite a bit open all along and there's vegetation they can get to. Great, that's, that's very helpful. Here's a question from Bob and Susan Roden. How long do trumpeter swans live? And um, I'll just add a bit to that. What do they die of? Do they just die of old age or is it one of the things you were talking about earlier? So they live, theoretically in the wild, they'll live to be about 12 to 15 years old. Though we have reports because we have them tagged of one that lived past 27 and bred up until she was 27. and. Uh, in captivity, they can live up to 30 years. Because of what they eat, they will have lead build up in their bodies over time. I'm not sure if they actually, it's hard to say if they die of old age or they die because they're, because they're older and they're not as quick to notice bad things happening around them. So it might be easier at that point for uh, predators to catch them. Uh, right now, we have a much higher mortality with them being poisoned or hurt or mm -hmm. things like that. Great. Thank you. Here's a question from David Kondo. How well do trumpeter swans and mute swans tolerate each other in terms of their behavior? Uh, since mute swans are in a I guess you might call them an invasive species. I mean, they were brought here and naturalized. How much of a threat do they pose to trumpeter swans? For I guess you'd be talking about competition for resources. Yeah, that's uh, the biggest thing they have. Though there's a different problem in the Eastern United States where the mute swans are so prolific and feral that uh, they don't breed as dedicated as every year as the trumpeters do. And uh, when the young, when there's a lot of young, they'll sort of be in quite large groups and go up into sandy shores, beaches, so to speak. But those beaches are also areas where endangered shorebirds are. And uh, I think it was the Carolina. It, yeah, we were in Maryland and they had a huge program to uh, cull trumpet, uh, mute swans because of the damage they did to the environment for the other species they had there. Trumpeters and mutes don't normally, uh, they're not too friendly. We've seen some cases where they've been friends. They speak, they both speak different languages. They can breed together. It's usually been forced upon them when they had no choice and nature abhors a vacuum. And of course, everything's programmed to procreate. So as mute swans are the invasives, how much do they threat? 
the problem is that they're taking over some of the prime habitat where trumpeter swans could also be. Mm -hmm. um, they do compete for resources. They actually do give swans a bad name because I've seen a lot more aggression and mute swans towards humans than I have trumpeter swans. Anytime a trumpeter swan is aggressive to a human, it's probably because you're too close to them or they're not so much them as their babies. They are very fer ferociously protective of their young. Uh, yeah, the mute swans, there's a lot of discourse about let nature take its course. They'll they fill the void when we remove the trumpeter swans. Uh, humans have just screwed up our environment so much. I'd rather not have the mute swans here, but I'm not going out of my way to decimate them, eradicate them completely from the landscape. I just wish people be more responsible if they have avicultural pairs, like people who actually buy purchase swans and put them on their ponds. I would like to see them be more responsible about pinioning their swans so that they can't fly away and go into the environment and be feral. It's the same with cats. Uh, people should not be letting them become feral or at least taking care of what doesn't belong here in a more humane way. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that, uh, Donna. I have a couple of questions myself. Um, yep. I'm curious about the, the captive um, breeding program that, that Harry Lumsden started. You're, you've got a very small sample. How, how did he manage the genetic pool problem if you've got a small sample to get to avoid inbreeding? So the, the first bunch of cooperative swans where you put a pair of swans and people were breeding them and either collecting the eggs or increasing the amount of eggs they had that yeah that would have been a concern but when he brought in the extra eggs from Alaska he quite quickly opened up the genetic pool by bringing in fresh blood so to speak now we also have the swans from the Midwest coming out to Western Ontario as well as, oh, as well as Manitoba. And now there's, uh, recently saw a video of swans in Saskatchewan, trumpeter swans, not tundras. But uh, he had a better, uh, more diverse group of swans at the beginning than they thought they had when they thought there was only less than a hundred swans left in the world. With the, having the, the large amount of swans, large amount, even 2000, that really isn't a whole huge amount, but that is more genetic diversity than there is in the California condors mm -hmm. or other uh, hoops, a few other breeds that have, they're trying to keep them from going extinct. Mm -hmm. So we have a much better luck if the diversity, if we started seeing too many genetic defects, we probably could see if we could bring in some more Alaska eggs and see who has breeding pairs on their ponds where we could put some eggs in to see if we could get a bit more diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Ontario population, there is one genetic marker that that has come up more often than in other populations, and that is uh, Lewistic. So the swan looks normal. It's a white bird to start with. So what it doesn't have is the pigments in its feet. It mm -hmm. still has a black bill, but it will have equivalent to orange feet. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a gene that's associated with that because one of the captive breeding pairs was Lewistic. And mm -hmm. that gene has gone through the population. So every now and then you'll get two swans that will have a single Lewistic signet as well as normal signets. Occasionally the parents will kill that one because it's odd. Mm -hmm. their, their, their coats are whiter. They don't look the same as the other ones. Not always. Some of them are fine and they are very good parents. They don't care how ugly their children are. So. <laughs> Donna, if I may. Yep. 
I mean, the, the population that Harry started with was not just exclusively the Alaska eggs. No, it wasn't. It was the he Midwest. Did life, he did bring in live birds from the West. And he also purchased birds from uh, people who bred uh, avian species. Um, he did also too, I mean, there was two batches of eggs from Alaska. Um, and I've got the original, some of his original records, which actually go directly to a particular nest uh, in Alaska. Um, but the gene pool to start with was very limited. Um, and his, in his breeding program, again, I have his records where the, the birds were identified uh, with bands and tags, and he would um, break a pair up uh, of these captive birds, and he would move the male from one breeder or one what we call cooperator to another cooperators in exchange, uh, and some of that went on as well. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I have no records or see anywhere in his records or have ever heard him say um, that what he was doing was any deliberate plan to spread the gene pool. The plan was to get them back. And he had a very limited start. And when a bird, when he was buying a bird and it cost $2,000 for a bird, back in the 80s, that was a lot of money. Thank you, Gary. Um, Another question, Donna, this arises from an experience I had myself with a trumpeter swan canoeing in uh, Coots Paradise with my daughter and, uh, and partner. And um, we happened upon a trumpeter and her, uh, her babies and boy, did she chase us. She honked and chased our canoe like crazy. And we paddled like crazy to get out of there. Um, do all the do all the swan species protect their young like that? And are there other are there any really major differences in behavior among the different species? For the most part, they, they will be very protective of their babies. There's definitely the first two weeks they're so vulnerable to so many things. There'll be some swans that are much more aggressive than others. The others that have been raised or have close association with people seem to be a little bit calmer about it. But if you're, we got a wild population happening now. They're much more protective. They don't want people to bug them. And if they've had any issues in the past with either canoeists coming up too close to their nest or things like that, they may actually become more aggressive. We have a few bad natured trumpeter swans that were very grumpy. Uh, <laughs> I tried to be kind about that, yeah. But uh, they're not normally aggressive towards people. They don't want to be hurt. Mm -hmm. they, they look at you, they, they will acknowledge that you exist. Uh, when I have strangers come with me to come down to the pond where I feed the swans, I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm a non, let's see, a non hurtful being that's coming down to them. The other ones, they have no idea. So they will do a, a call that's basically stranger danger, stranger danger. And they mm -hmm. don't want, they basically, every, everyone knows that there's something different in the environment. Uh, it's also been documented, documented in Missouri about the woman who fed swans on the lake, on the, no, on the river there. Uh, downstream of a nuclear reactor but uh, she could go down there and the swans wouldn't spook anyone else that went by they would spook and uh, it's partly because they live a long time they do have facial recognition I've tried to disguise myself but they still know who I am <laughs> uh, they always knew who Harry was because he he caught and poked and prodded far too many of them for them to be comfortable with him coming to do that to their babies as well. But uh, yeah, that's, they are very, they are protective of their signets. The neat thing about the trumpeter swans is that the, 
both parents raise their signets. The male helps a little bit during the, uh, the, the incubation, but not as much as we would like to believe. But when it comes to raising them and protecting them afterwards, fiercely protective. If he loses the mate, the male will still raise the signets and take him to the wintering staging area with him. If the female loses a mate, she will take her signets still to the winter staging area. And if she's in a healthy breeding age female, she'll just do a deep sigh and go, okay, what's the best option I got here? And she will go and get herself a new man. Great, thank you. We've got some more questions. Um, Kelly Duffin is back with um, a question. This goes back, I think, to captive breeding. I read that early in the reintroduction re re process, Harry Lumsden had a plan to replace mute swan eggs <laughs> with trumpeter eggs and nests. If that happened, was that successful? Uh, yes, sort of. So he did, because we didn't have the resources the same as the states did, there was no uh, trying to raise the swans without imprinting on humans and stuff like that, without having uh, swans present. He did put the eggs under mute swans. They had a slightly less successful rate at hatching them. Uh, there was a problem with the mute male attacking and killing the cygnets afterwards until Harry got some hair dye and dyed them so they looked the same as the rest of the <laughs> cygnets. So it was sort of okay, but when you, I, I'd have, to, Gary might know, but I don't think he put Alaska eggs under the mutes. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, they, they all went, most, most of the Alaska eggs were hatched in incubators. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's a question from Melinda. Um, about the LaSalle um, area. As the population grows there, will there be enough natural food for the swans at LaSalle to sustain them? So as the population grows, <coughs> I've, I've seen, uh, it's not scientific, it's anecdotal, that they start exhibiting proper wild behaviors very similar to the tundra swans in that they will not there's a carrying capacity. We really haven't gone much over 200 at LaSalle unless we have severe freezes. Um, same as my place here. Uh, so I've had it go up over the past, this is 2005 to now is 16, 17 years. So I thought I had a lot when I had 50 swans here, my carrying capacity and it's remained stable, even though I have more and more breeding pairs coming back here is 200 to 220. It goes up to 250 when we get a cold spell or bad weather, forcing them down. So no matter, the biggest problem is, is not so much whether or not LaSalle will handle them, is that is there are other places around that'll also give them access to food because they don't want to crowd themselves any more than they have to. Mm -hmm. So they basically police themselves. Even at night here, I have two ponds with open water. I feed the majority on one pond. And I, as soon as I, they hear me coming, they start talking. The other guys on the other side here, and I have them flying in the entire time I'm feeding. But by the time nighttime comes, they go back to their night roost. So they'll split up the population even then. And But I'm still maintaining mm -hmm. around 175 to 220 swans. Well, we've got a couple more questions on the feeding question. <clears throat> yep. Sophia usually brings treats to her swans when she visits them at Balmy Beach and Kew Beach. Um, do you know if anyone feeds them in the winter? Should she do it? Should she be feeding them? She's gone down to the beach a few times in the winter, but she hasn't seen them since October. So we, 
I don't need to feed the swans. The only reason I feed the swans is because I have two pinion swans, swans that cannot fly away. And in order to feed those two poor swans, I have to feed all the freeloaders that are there too, because I'm not prepared to, to scare them all away. The, because I have open water, I've also had an extraordinarily huge range of odd ducks, literally odd different ducks come here and, and winter here, either because they've been sort of injured and they can't quite make the migration or they got stuck got lost, got pushed down in a severe storm, or they're just, they came here almost hungry. And uh, because I had the open water and different foods, the one pond is really healthy. The other pond has too much fertilizer going into it from the golf course, but that's a whole other story. We don't need to feed the swans in the winter. When we feed, it's uh, mostly for catching them or to tame them enough to eat out of your hand. If they eat out of the hand, you can catch them. And it's a very quick, easy catch, extremely non-stressful to the swan in the long run compared to different, more extravagant ways to do the catches. If you feed them, uh, please bear in mind, right now there is a boat of avian flu going out and about feed them what's more appropriate is whole corn on crack corn they can grind it in their gullet quite well without it being cracked it's uh easy fat for them but even though i feed the swans here today they were nowhere near as hungry because they wanted to eat natural <coughs> forage because mm -hmm. water opened up they can get to places they didn't get the snow moved off the grass they can eat that lovely fertilized high protein <laughs> grass on the golf course if you want to feed them you, you can but please also bear in mind that almost all jurisdictions have a no feeding wildlife policy to prevent nuisance birds and mm -hmm. nuisance wildlife so basically swans they can sustain themselves without human intervention when it goes down to minus 20 minus 30 they have so any one of birds, a songbird has about uh, three to 7,000 feathers on it. A raptor has up to eight to 10,000. A swan has 35,000 feathers on its body. I'm glad I wasn't the one counting, but anyways, and a two inch thick layer of down. They are basically grizzly bear of the bird world. They can handle those really extreme temperatures. That's mm -hmm. also why they don't need to migrate as farther south as long as they have open water. So they are, when it gets to be minus 20 or so, they can go. The picture you saw at the beginning where I had the two swans curled up, mm -hmm. they can stay like that for two or three days if they have to until the bad weather goes away. So if you see swans resting like that, do not disturb them. It's only going to cost them energy to get up and get away from you. So it's the uh, it's it's what they do. They're they're built for Canadian weather. So it's one of the few things that's Canadian made, built and bred. Yeah. Right. Um, I think we have time for two more questions, and then Ellen's going to join us and give us some announcements. Uh, tell us about the next lecture coming up. Um, as you know, Phragmites is a really uh -huh. big problem in a lot of our wetland areas. They, they're really taking over. Um, it, are Phragmites a problem for the swans? Do they, uh, can they still feed okay in wetland areas that are being uh, invaded by Phragmites? Uh, yes, they can still feed as long as there's still native species there. They don't eat the Phragmites itself. They can, uh, I know how bad the Phragmites is. It gets so dense that even the turtles can't get through it to get to the land to in order to lay their eggs. I also know it, it encroaches onto the wetland areas and makes areas where fish would spawn or make, the, we have a couple of different types that make sort of a nest mm -hmm. and that interferes with that. The swans in general, if a wetland is being naturally encroached by its own vegetation, not the invasive 
The swans eat so much of it. I've called them the bison of the lakes because they're, eat, they're, they're vegetarians, they're grazing. And because when their babies are young, they take their feet and they paddle them up and down to disturb all the stuff at the bottom that comes up closer to their babies. That's why everyone thought that if you had swans that would chase the Canada geese away, that works for six weeks when the babies are small enough that they can't feed at the depth that the adults can. Hmm. So the Phragmites doesn't really affect them. The swans actually can increase the biodiversity and help their species in a wetland if they're there. But the Phragmites, I'm afraid it's going to have to be us grunting and groaning and swearing at it to get it out of there and there's quite a few organizations that are trying to go frag free by i think it's 35 or 33 right. whatever rhymes yeah. better yeah um just one more question and then ellen's going to join us and give us some announcements um if we were in a snow piercer situation and everything froze if their bays froze could they still survive they can probably survive on the fat they have for at least two weeks. Usually none of our very severe events go much beyond that. I know out east, I think it's in the Ottawa area, there's a, they've had some places where they've always had swans and mostly mute, but there were trumpeters thrown in where they'd get into almost a starvation mode. But uh, for the most part, if the swans have to, they'll fly, they're going to find open water. If they can find open water, they can survive. Part of the reason they need the open water is they have to condition their feathers every day. They mm -hmm. don't condition their feathers. Whether they eat or not, they're going to get hypothermia. They right. have to have them good and in good condition to keep the wind out. So right. when their mouth is interfered with the fishing hook or something else, that's more concerning for me, not that the fact that they can still feed, but whether or not they can still preen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, if the bays freeze, they're still gonna be okay. As long as they're all healthy and they can fly, they'll get to open water someplace. Right, great. And hopefully we won't have a snow piercer event. <laughs> well, um, not that's... now, come on. We're just enjoying this minus, uh, plus 14, 15, yeah. Right, <laughs> Donna, thank you so much your uh, enthusiasm and uh, love of swans really came through in your presentation and uh, members of tfm really appreciate there are folks like you out there keeping these species growing and uh, protected and uh, good luck to you in the future thank you Yes, thank you, Donna. It was it was just um, terrific to hear you, and 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 thank you, Gary, as well. Not just not just for being here today, but um, for for all the work you do every day, and it's just amazing what volunteers can do. So so everybody, thank you so much for for sticking around. Uh, this will only take three minutes or so. I just want to make sure that we uh, we don't forget that we have other wonderful lectures coming up. Um, and as well, I want to mention that we do have uh, about seven walks in March for Toronto Field Naturalist members, including one, for example, here on St. Patrick's Day, we have one at St. Michael's Cemetery, and that's the one day of the year that this cemetery is open, so that's more of a heritage walk. But in any case, quite a range of, of interesting destinations for March, and you can register uh, as a member uh, at the, uh, at the member, go to the members pages of the TFN website. Um, just also to let you know that Toronto Field Naturalist is also doing outreach about the work that we do. Um, and we do that through Zoom talks as well. And uh, so you may, might stumble across bookings for, for talks that TFN is doing, where we really, it's their introductory talks to tell the public about the ravine system of Toronto and, and how important nature is. And uh, so here's a couple, one will be at Toronto CD Saturday uh, series. In fact, it's, uh, it's on a Tuesday evening, March 8th, so just a couple of days from now. And then here's one that we're doing for Heritage Toronto. So just so you're aware that we're doing outreach as well about our work. 
Um, our next regular lecture for members is on Sunday, April 3rd at 2.30 p.m. And we have Kathy Vatcher of the Mycological Society of Toronto giving, giving us an introduction to the world of mycology. And so it's not just mushrooms, but the whole wonderful, uh, endlessly important things that, that, uh, that fungi of every kind do. So come for that. And then we also have more of a, a policy um, uh, event to because we know we have a municipal election coming up in uh, in uh, Toronto um, in and in, uh, in October, and it's important for us to know how the city plans to care for nature. And Jane Weninger is a senior planner for the city of Toronto, and she's going to share with us the major policies from the city's perspective, how they work, and also share pointers on how to engage with the city if you're interested in protecting nature. And um, finally, just uh, a reminder that spring is coming. And uh, <laughs> so uh, today we certainly have an example of that and, uh, and we can still get out there and enjoy the, the afternoon sun. So thank you everybody for, for joining us and we hope to see you again uh, very soon. Take care. <laughs>